Good evening. My name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants. Welcome to another International Dermatology Education Foundation Educational Series webinar. This evening, we're going to be exploring topical reflumolabs beyond the surface. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Leon Kursik, who is the president of the International Dermatology Education Foundation, clinical professor of dermatology at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis, and medical director of physician skin care, derm research, and skin sciences in Louisville, Kentucky. Our speakers this evening is Dr. Christopher Bunick, who is associate professor of dermatology at the Program in Translational Biomedicine, Yale University School of Medicine, Department of Dermatology in New Haven, Connecticut, and Dr. James Q. Del Rosso, who is adjunct clinical professor of dermatology at Turo University, Nevada, Henderson, Nevada, Research Director, Principal Investigator at JDR Dermatology Research, Las Vegas, Nevada, and Senior Vice President at Clinical Research and Strategic Development, Advancement Dermatology and Cosmetic Surgery in Maitland, Florida. We'd like to thank our supporter, Arcutis, for making this educational event possible. Before we begin, a couple of logistic tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be presented. If you're having technical issues, please submit your questions in the question pane in the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in the browser and will be emailed to you one to two days later. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could fill it in and send it back to us. Within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Again, please submit your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of the screen. And without further ado, I will pass the floor now to Dr. Leon Kursik. Thank you, Roxanne, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to a wonderful program tonight. It is very different than the others that we had in the past. And uh, just a brief opening remarks on International Dermatology Education Foundation. As you know, we are a nonprofit organization. Next slide, Roxanne, please. And our uh, principal mission is to raise awareness and improve dermatology care all over the world through education, especially in underserved areas. As you may know, we've been doing our webinars for the last couple of years now. We started as during COVID. We also had live programs in the past, which we are still going on with those live programs. Next slide, please. We have served uh, overall the whole dermatology community, not only in the US, but in Canada, in South America, as well as in Europe and Southeast Asia with our previous programs that most of you may be familiar with. Tonight, however, I am really excited to discuss and talk about roflomilas. And we're going to start with our first polling question. Is there an oral roflomilas, right? We all know about the topical roflomilas, and we're going to learn more tonight. It's been approved. It's been around now for a while. How about, is there oral roflamilase? Where did this molecule come from? So, the options are very simple, yes or no? Well, maybe. And the answer is, more than the majority said yes. And yes, there is actually oral roflamilase. And you're going to hear this from Dr. Chris Brunick, our next speaker. So, next slide, please. So our next speaker is really gonna explore topical roflomilas and tell us all about where it came from and the studies with not only topical, but some of the oral roflomilas as well. Chris Brinick is an associate professor of dermatology at Yale University School of Medicine. He is one of the biggest brains in dermatology, I'm proud to say, and he's a good friend of mine and he's really gonna give us what's beyond roflomilas that we have not heard. So go ahead, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. No, thank you, Leon. That was a very kind introduction. And thank you for uh, to all the, the people listening in and spending the evening with us talking about topical reflubilas. So, By the way, yeah. a well, warm welcome to Dr. Jim Del Rosso, which I will introduce, but I think everybody knows Dr. Del Rosso, who is the other one of the bigger brains in clinical dermatology. Thank you, Jim, for being with us tonight. Pleasure to be here. Great to see both of you. Yeah. 
So here's my, my cover slide. You know, we're gonna talk in this first uh, half of the program, uh, kind of on the science side, what is it that makes the reflumolase molecule special and different uh, in the PDE4 inhibitor class? These are my disclosures. So let's start by just simply talking about why are non-steroidal topicals needed and where are they used in dermatology? And if we look, focus in on the center circle here, I've kind of highlighted a number of different non-steroidal topicals that we use throughout dermatology. So we start at 12 o'clock and go counterclockwise. We got antifungals, topical calcineurin inhibitors, vitamin D analogs, aerial hydrocarbon receptor agonists, JAK inhibitors, and then we have PD-4 inhibitors. Now, I show four uh, important dermatologic diseases here, psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, and vitiligo. And these different non-steroidals are certainly used to treat all of these conditions. Uh, PD-4 inhibitors in particular uh, are used in psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis, and they'll soon, they, they are used in atopic dermatitis, but topical reflumolast is soon to be approved in that area as well. And so one of the big questions that comes both clinically and scientifically is, how is it that PD-4 inhibitors are so versatile against so many different types of inflammatory dermatoses, especially when the molecular uh, signature, the molecular basis for these diseases are actually very different? And so we're going to answer that question over the next uh, several slides. So here's our next polling question. What inflammatory pathway or pathways uh, does PDE4 drive? So it gives you three choices here. It's sort of a, a trick question, but a little bit. Let's see what the results are. Yeah, so here we can see that most people picked all of the above because it, it showed TH1, TH2, TH22, TH17. And, and here you can see, you know, six and 10 people are saying all the above, and that is correct. And that is part of what makes uh, PD-4 so important in dermatology is that it actually drives uh, the inflammatory inflammation in, in each of these types of immune response. Okay, back to the slides. So Chris, if, I, if you don't mind, if I can chime in. So it shows the versatility of this molecule that you're right, we can use it in different pathways, psoriasis, atopic derm, you name it. Right, and I'm gonna show let me reclaim her. I'm going to show on these coming slides that what really makes PD4 uh, special is because it has a role in driving cytokines from each of these types of immune responses. So, so here, this is a slide that just talks about how inhibiting PD4 reduces skin inflammation. So here, what we're looking at is kind of epidermis, dermis, and the idea is, you know, it's kind of colored red. It's representing inflammation in any one of the dermatoses that we just talked about. And, and the idea is that uh, you have immune responses that can be Th1, Th2, Th22. Uh, the Th17 isn't pictured here, but that's also there. So what's actually happening? If you look at the, if you look at the sequence at the bottom, uh, ATP, right, our energy source, ATP is actually converted to the secondary signaling molecule, cyclic AMP, by adenylate cyclase. And it turns out cyclic AMP, and, I, and this is something I never really knew when I was learning about cyclic AMP in biochemistry class in, in college and in medical school, but cyclic AMP turns out, at least in skin diseases, to be very, very anti-inflammatory. So we want high levels of cyclic AMP. The problem is, that phosphodiesterases, in particular PDE4 in the skin, breaks down or hydrolyzes, the technical term is hydrolyzes cyclic AMP to AMP. And so what we want to do when we're using a PD4 inhibitor is stop that hydrolysis that, of cyclic AMP to AMP. And that boosts the cyclic AMP levels. And there's several very important consequences on the skin that occur because of this. We get improved or increased skin barrier integrity. We get increased muscle relaxation, decreased interleukin release, which is kind of 
what I was alluding to on the poll question, right? That so many of these uh, interleukins uh, and cytokines really are, are linked uh, to phosphodiesterase activity and then the decreased immune response. And I think really what's so important, Chris, is, you know, PD4 is there physiologically, but when there's too much activity in a disease state, this is actually happening in in the cells, uh, really throughout the skin and in other parts of the body. So it's such an important concept, what you just said. Right. So let's let's look at it from a slightly different angle here. So on the left, I show adenylyl cyclase. So this is what's taking ATP and converting it to cyclic AMP. Uh, and the cyclic AMP, you can see PDE4 shown here in blue, uh, PD, it takes the cyclic AMP and converts it to AMP. But what you can see with this red X here, when you have a PD4 inhibitor, it gums up this, this kind of link between the adenylyl cyclase to the PD4 to stop that conversion and boost cyclic AMP. So what is it about PD-4 inhibitors? They modulate inflammatory cytokines by inhibiting PD-4. They bind to PD-4 at this cyclic AMP binding site. And, and what we've shown, and I'm gonna show some of the research from my laboratory over the next slides to really help you understand what makes reflumolase stand out among PD-4 inhibitors, but that the more you mimic cyclic AMP, the more you can mimic how cyclic AMP binds PD-4 and make it so that the molecule mimics it but binds strongly, you're gonna get a better inhibitor and, and, and you're gonna get higher binding affinity and selectivity and we're gonna talk about all those issues. But from a clinical standpoint, probably the biggest take home message that I can give you is that PD-4 inhibitors can reduce the expression of key pro-inflammatory cytokines across type one, type two, and type three cytokines. This is Th1, Th2, TH17 responses, as well as the TH22 responses. And you can see that some of the cytokines listed here, these are some of the players that we talk about all the time in our clinics, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, IL-4, IL-17, IL-23. So when you see all these different types of cytokines that we're used to throwing into buckets, right? Atopic dermatitis, TH2 cytokines, or psoriasis, right? Where you have your TH17 or TH1 cytokines. The point is PDE, PDE4 is important for all of these. And I think that that is why we're seeing topical reflumolast come out with such versatility uh, in, uh, in clinical dermatology at the moment. But it, it's more than that. Why is it that the topical reflumolast is excelling where maybe other PDM4, PDE4 inhibitors have not had as much success? You know, Chris, we're gonna you, highlight that. You, you make a really important point about the buckets. The fact of the matter is we put too much in buckets. A lot of these different profiles actually can happen at different points in the same disease. So that's another very important part of it. Yeah. Well, there's science, Jim, that shows that we've known for a long time, actually, that atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, kind of, kind of like a Venn diagram, there's a, a number of overlapping genes in those two diseases. Uh, and so, it, yes, there's, you think of it as a Venn diagram and these diseases overlap. And at right. the center of these diseases, you could argue, is PDE4. It's a very uh, interesting concept. Okay. It's right so in what there. I wanted to you do know, before you know, we get so, into it. Jim, you know, the, per the perception that the reason why we bucket things because of the targeting the cytokines, and we're so used to the biologic treatments that's targeting that particular cytokine, and that's why we bucket things, and we don't think about the small molecules intracellular process. Sorry, and, Chris, you know, I interrupted. Yeah, and yeah. when we said that, you know, a disease is a TH2 disease, and we find out that TH1 also contributes, and yeah. TH at different points in the disease, it's so important what's being shown here by Chris. Right. So we think about, you know, there's been a lot of talk in dermatology about the ability for JAK inhibitors to broadly inhibit cytokines. But the point I'm making here is that reflumolast and PD4 inhibitors do the same thing, right? So it's a very interesting concept, and I don't think people have necessarily thought about PD-4 inhibitors as broad cytokine inhibitors uh, before. So what I wanted to do is kind of show a little bit of a clinical story as to how I got into looking in my laboratory at the deep science of, of PD-4 inhibitors. So this here is a, uh, a summary of the publication in the New England Journal of Medicine of the 
uh, phase 2B uh, randomized controlled trial looking at topical reflumolast cream in chronic plaque psoriasis. So you can see it had about 331 adults with plaque psoriasis. The goal was, or, or measurement from your endpoint was IgA status clear or almost clear. Uh, and then they, they document here the application site reactions. On the, the two left columns here, we see the reflumolast, two different uh, strengths of the cream, 0.3 and 0.15%. And both of them had somewhere around 23 to 28% achievement of this IgA clear, almost clear for the plaque psoriasis and very, very low application site reactions, actually less than the vehicle cream, which serves as the placebo and, are, and certainly much uh, sig more significant uh, clearance of the plaque psoriasis. This was followed up by, let's see if we, there we go. So this was followed up by, oh, let me, sorry, let me go back. This was followed up by a phase three trial of the 0.3% topical reflumolast cream and plaque psoriasis. So, so let me just walk you through this and, and it's sort of setting up the story of what I wanna share with you on the science side. So here, this was looking at once daily reflumolast cream compared with vehicle. Okay, we had two separate trials, right? Parallel uh, control, randomized controlled trials, around 440-ish patients in each trial, 40 sites uh, each trial mean age around 47 uh, years. And the, here we're seeing that about 300-ish patients got topical reflumolast in each trial and about 150 were on the, the vehicle or placebo. And the primary outcomes, again, were IgA success, clear, almost clear, plus two or more grade improvement at week eight. So we're looking at two months, week eight. Uh, and on the right, what we see is the ref, topical reflumolast Roughly around 37 to 42% of the patients actually were achieving this IgA clear, almost clear with two point or more improvement uh, at week eight compared to only 6%-ish of the placebo. So almost 30 to 40% advantage for the topical reflumolast. This was a really incredible uh, result for the topical reflumolast and plaque psoriasis. I've always said a picture is worth a thousand words. And what we're seeing here across the top is a thickened plaque on the knee that at eight weeks is basically gone with topical reflumolast. And then so important to have non-steroidal agents that are potent and effective in intertriginous areas. And so here, what we see is resolution of psoriasis uh, in the axilla, which is incredibly important uh, to have this uh, ability to treat intertriginous areas confidently and safely with a non-steroidal. So, Chris, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. You know, the intertriginous areas here, until now, we did not have anything to treat intertriginous psoriasis, really, right? As far as I know, that has been at least studied formally in a phase three study. Right. I think that, that people uh, used, uh, you know, topical calcineur inhibitors as their kind of non-steroidal in intertriginous areas, or they, they simply use steroidal agents in those areas for very limited uh, time. But to have a, a medicine like topical reflumolast that, that in clinical trials shows efficacy and safety in intertriginous areas is a game changer because I think we all see lots of patients with psoriasis in skin folds and, and it becomes, it's a huge unmet need. And now in my, in my clinic, I do use topical reflumolast cream uh, in uh, psoriasis in skin folds all the time. I think it's a great option for patients. Well, let, let's be clear about this, though. The other agents were used in intertriginous areas in the clinical trials. They just didn't do a separate IgA on just the intertriginous areas and a separate analysis on the safety and tolerability just in the intertriginous areas. That's the only time it's been with top done is with topical reflumolast. So that that's the first time that's been done. But the other agents have been evaluated. They, it was just all pulled together. And obviously the corticosteroids we have to be very, very careful about. And in all fairness, we also have a new phase four study for another non-steroidal -top, uh, non topical for intertriginous areas. That's correct, yeah. So one of the things that really struck me, so this is actually a patient of mine that came in, she's in her mid forties, had been really suffering with plaque psoriasis, but also a palmal plantar pustular psoriasis. And on the left, you know, this is a patient who the best therapy that she had ever had was an anti-IL-17A biologic. But despite being on that biologic, the palmal plantar pustular psoriasis just really wasn't 
clearing up. And, and she had very painful uh, feet, had difficulty ambulating. And I tried the topical reflumolast cream and look on the right, you can see just basically complete clearance of her feet. Uh, to be honest, I, I wasn't expecting this result. I was really shocked. And one of the things that this inspired me to do was to say, well, how is it? Why is it that in this particular patient that topical reflumolast was so effective where, you know, clobetasol, other steroids, and, and, and even biologics just weren't touching the feet? And so this kind of was the, the jumping point for my laboratory to, to do a little bit of a deeper dive into what is it that's different well, about you know, topical reflumolast well, Chris, I think an important point is, I mean, the biologic, the anti-L17A helped, but the, even the, these agents don't necessarily get everybody clear. And topical agents are very important to use. And, and it makes sense what you're saying, looking at the other cytokines that are being being affected, that these really team up very beautifully together, as you've shown. Well, adjunctive Chris, therapy. Sorry, how, how long did it take for this? Do you remember? This, it was it was relatively quick within four to eight weeks it was very wow. quick thank you yeah and, and so i think that this is uh, so jim what you're getting to is adjunctive therapy uh, for topical for psoriasis is very important i think a lot of clinicians are using a, a topical for that you know one or two uh, percent body surface area that may come come or, or wax and wane and so it is very important for us to remember and to learn and, and to understand uh, our repertoire of topical uh, agents in psoriasis, that's not going away. We need to know right. that. And, and certainly in other diseases too, same thing for atopic dermatitis, uh, all these diseases where we have these advanced biologics and JAK inhibitors and other systemics, the topicals still play a very important role for the patient. And they certainly did for this case that I just showed. And I think that's the take home. We all, all the physicians listening in have patients that need this, this kind of extra little boost. And they could use it as long as they needed to. They don't have to be worrying about, oh, I have to stop it because it was a corticosteroid. But I don't want to eat up too much of your time yeah. with the comments. We got a lot so to go over. Thing, so it's okay, thing. Chris, sorry. I really love this slide. The fact that you're showing the crystallography, the molecular structure of the uh, aroflomilast and the clinical results. And I know crystallography is sort of your shtick. Can you tell us a little bit more about the structure here? Yeah, so I'm going to walk everyone through uh, kind of exactly what PDE4s are and how is it that reflumolast is working and how I think they're working differently than a primolast and a crisabarol because I think that's the key question that clinicians have. How is this different than other PDE4 inhibitors? And I'm a big believer uh, in structure, that structure dictates function. And, and that's why, you know, you know, we talk about genotype phenotype correlations in dermatology all the time. But the genotype generally is encoding for proteins, right? Or it might be encoding for different RNA macro, you know, molecules. But the idea is that there's structure to those molecules and that structure dictates function. And, and so I call that bridge between genotype and phenotype structure a type. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the structure a type of uh, PD4 inhibitors. Okay, so here we're just looking at PDE4 hydrolase. I told you that PDE4 uh, was a hydrolase, right? So on the left, this is the PD4 enzyme bound to the AMP. So you can see here, this is where AMP is binding in a deep cleft among these alpha helices. If we go to the middle column, this is how uh, PDE4 recognizes the AMP. Uh, AMP. And, and here we're looking at the adenine base bound between PDE4 residues. So the green represents PDE4 residues, and here's the adenine base in the middle with the, the yellow and blue. What I really want to highlight first is this, this Q369, glutamine 369. This residue is conserved amongst all PDEs in the entire family. So we're looking at over 10 different PDE uh, types. It's conserved in all of them because it's so critical to the binding mechanism of substrate. We can see that the adenine base is sandwiched. It's like, it's like cheese in a sandwich. You have this phenylalanine 372 on underneath it, and you have isoleucine on top of it. So this part of the, the substrate is sandwiched between two hydrophobic residues. You also see an asparagine that's making hydrogen bonds, and then this tyrosine that's also linking to the nitrogen. So this is looking at the stability of the adenine base part of AMP. 
So if we go over to the right, now we're looking more at, at the other end uh, of the molecule where the, um, where the AMP is binding at a metal ion binding site. So you may not know that PDE4 is a, has a metal catalytic mechanism. So you see two divalent cation, uh, cations here. There's zinc in this particular image, uh, but this could be uh, zinc or magnesium. But the idea is that you have a metal ion catalytic site. You see, you can see here coordination with the, the phosphate of the AMP, and then the adenine base is down here, which we just talked about in the kind of the blue, which represents nitrogen atoms and the, the, the yellow, the carbon atoms. So you can see here at the very bottom is your glutamine, this highly conserved glutamine binding. You can see the phenylalanine on top, the isoleucine below, sandwiching it in. And then again, over here, you see the, the metal ion site. But what is really unique about PDE4s is the water structure around there. Water is well known to aid in catalytic or enzymatic reactions. And one of the key things that we found in, in, in our research was that this water four, it's called, it's the fourth water label here. So it's water four. It, ser it, it makes or, or serves the purpose of making a hydrogen bond network from the metal ion site all the way to the other end where the adenine base is anchored. Right, so you can see here the hydrogen bonds at the phosphate site, hydrogen bonds to water four, which is hydrogen bonding to the tyrosine, the asparagine, and then back to the adenine base. So this critical structured water links the metal ion site to the conserved glutamine all through a hydrogen bonded network. And this is gonna become very important as a distinguishing factor between the PDE4 inhibitors. Okay. So this is just a, a slide that, to show the catalytic mechanism. I mentioned you know, catalysis or uh, the ability to be a hydrolase. On the left is looking at the enzyme, so PDE4 bound to cyclic AMP. And what this is just simply showing, you can see that here it's in a circle, right? The, the cyclic AMP, there's a ring, and it's just showing how at the metal ion site, this helps drive, uh, drive the uh, hydrolysis of the cyclic part of cyclic AMP, and you can see how it's open over here. The ring is open. So here's the enzyme AMP, and the reverse cyclization right, can happen through adenylocyclase, which we talked about earlier. So the idea, you have ring open, ring closed, cyclic AMP, and there's just AMP. Okay. So let's take a closer look at chemical structures of cyclic AMP and our PDE4 inhibitors in dermatology. So in the upper left, we have cyclic AMP itself, and it has a binding constant of around one to six micromolar. If we go to B, we see a primalast. So its binding is around 0.14 micromolar. We can see at the bottom in D, this is crisabarol, has an IC50 around 0.75 micromolar. And if we go over left to reflumalast in panel C, it's around 0.7 nanomolar, right? So reflumalast has a much higher binding affinity than either cyclic AMP, apremalast, or crisabarol. So we're gonna take a little bit of look as to why that is, but just notice there's similarity between the chemical structures of each of these with cyclic AMP. What's unique about, uh, a print, we'll, we'll just focus on apremalast for a second, it has a sulfur uh, atom here bound to some oxygens. Down here in panel D, we can see crisabarol, the boron part of the name, it has a boron atom. And that boron is essential for its metal, to, to bind to that metal ion bind, uh, catalysis site uh, in the, uh, the PD4 uh, enzyme. And then reflumalast, we'll touch on this, we can see there's a couple chemical groups here, and I'm gonna walk you through each of those. One of the points I wanted to make on the far right is the importance of the boron in crisabarol. So in the third uh, chemical structure down, it's substituted with carbon. And what we see is that the binding affinity drops. It gets over 10,000 micromolars. So when you lose your, your boron, you lose your binding affinity. So that just shows you that for this particular molecule, the boron is essential, uh, right? But the boron is unique to the chrysoberol. Okay. So how's reflumalast working? So here in the upper left, we see just the chemical uh, structure of reflumalast, but it's color coded based on atoms. So you can see that 
On the left side of the molecule here in green, there's a couple chlorine atoms, but also on the uh, right, you can see in the light blue, some fluorine atoms. And then you see this uh, cyclo, uh, cyclic group up here in the upper right. So these are a few features of the reflumolacin. We'll, we'll dig into more what each one does. In the bottom left, what we're looking at is reflumolast is in yellow, and in grayish is cyclic AMP. And the whole point of this is to simply show that cyc the reflumolast overlaps or superimposes with cyclic AMP very, very well, right? They, they look like they're having a very, very similar binding mechanism. If we blow up the reflumolast on the right, look at what we're seeing. So on the left, we're seeing the metal ion binding site. We see how reflumolast is making hydrogen bonds and interacting with the metal ion metal ions in the waters around them. We see the water four that's being uh, that's important for bridging the ions metal ion site to the conserved glutamine through hydrogen bonding network. And then we see this conserved glutamine that's anchoring the other end of the reflumolast. So one of the simplest ways to remember all this is just that there are three major anchor points in the binding reflumolast, right? You have one here at the metal ions, one with water, one with glutamine. So I want you to remember reflumolast, three, three key anchor or binding points that help contribute to its high binding affinity. Now, there's been some talk or rumors in dermatology that reflumolast binding affinity is due to the fluorine atoms. Because when you look at the molecule and we, we think about fluorine uh, in, in some of our other uh, products in dermatology, we the natural conclusion is reflumolast has fluorine, therefore maybe that's what's contributing to its uh, high potency, but that's not true. So there's a derivative of reflumolast called piclamolast. And when you remove the fluorine atoms, you actually get an even higher binding affinity of 0.024 nanomolar. Uh, so, so the fluorines themselves are not contributing to the high binding affinity of reflumolast. Okay, so how is it that reflumolast differs from a primolast? And this is a really important question. So the way, the simple way I think about it, a primolast is a bender, reflumolast is a non-bender. So what do I mean by that? So if we look on the left, we're looking at a primolast in gray here. And again, I highlighted the sulfur atom earlier, and that's here in yellow. What we're seeing is at the, at the conserved glutamine, we see that the chemical structure of a primolast is actually quite similar to reflumolast. It makes the same hydrogen bonding networks. But instead of interacting with the metal ion site in the same way as reflumolast, a primolast has almost a 90 degree bend into a hydrophobic pocket in PDE4 that really I don't think people understand that that actually kind of limits what a primolast can do. So here that the sulfur atom does interact with the metal ion site, but you have this bend. There's no hydrogen bond to this water. So there's no link through hydrogen bonding across here by that structured water. So when I think of a primolast, I think of bender and two major binding anchor points. Some people will say that this bend into the hydrophobic cavity, why not these hydrophobic interactions? How could that not make it stronger? Well, in some other entities it might, but in the case of a primolast, this pocket is probably actually weakening. There's an energy penalty from trying to go into this hydrophobic pocket, and that limits the binding affinity of a primolast. If we look on the right, I have overlaid a primolast with reflumolast. Reflumolast is in yellow, the primolast in gray, and I'm highlighting the point that you can see the water four uh, that a reflumolast is able to bind, but not a, a primolast because of the bend, and that a primolast has a bend, reflumolast does not. They both are highly similar at the conserved glutamine. So Chris, I really have to thank you because this is fascinating that you sort of explained it so well I mean, most of us really uh, in the clinics, we don't think about this, we don't hear about it, we don't know about it, but now it makes all sense what's going on in the real world and how we can sort of take this type of information and relate it when we treat our patients. You know, right. I think that the, sorry, I was going to say, Leon, I think that the Go key ahead. point is that a lot of clinicians uh, kind of g have given up on PD4 inhibitors. Maybe they're not as potent, they're not as strong, but the chemistry of reflumolast is optimized to be a better inhibitor. And that's what I'm trying to show that 
all PD4 inhibitors are not created equal. And I think that that's the important point that people need to, to remember. And here I'm showing a premolast. This is that hydrophobic pocket that it's bending into. You can see the residues here. Chris, there was, there was a paper that actually compared different PD4 inhibitors and showed that reflumolast had greater PD4 activity, inhibition activity than several others, including chrysoboral and apremolast. But, but this depth of exactly why and the different binding is, is an excellent explanation. But it goes back to what we often say, but don't have this depth to be able to explain is we can assume that drugs in the same class are gonna behave the same. And if the first drugs you're, you're starting to use in clinical practice have you know, some degree of efficacy, but they don't wow anybody, you know, and, and we've had that situation with a premolas, it's good, but it's not blockbuster in terms of the efficacy in psoriasis. We tend to throw that on that class. And you've proven here that we have to look at each drug independently. And it's right. a beautiful and, job. It's a beautiful yeah, thank job. You, Jim. So Jim, uh, along those lines, the best analogy I'll give is that just think to the biologics that we use, whether it's psoriasis or atopic dermatitis, you can do what's called intra-class switching and get great responses, right? Yep. How is it that one psoriasis patient responds to, uh, won't respond to one TNF alpha inhibitor, but yet will respond to another? And it all comes down to the molecular science, and that's what I'm trying to convey here. Molec so when molecular look science and differences in, for in this case, formulation and several different yeah. factors, but this is the root of why these drugs may work differently. Right, so, so I said that- say, This is not your father's Chevy. Yeah. <laughs> so I said that uh, that reflumolas has three major anchor points. Uh, Primolas has two with a bend, and crisabarol only has one anchor point. Okay. So what we're looking here up at the top is crisabarol. Uh, it's modified with one extra uh, nitrogen here, but that's irrelevant because it's away from the, uh, the metal ion binding site. But we can see here that the boron plays a massive role. Uh, at the metal ion binding site, it really gives crisabarol all its power. Uh, if we look at B, though, where you look at uh, crisabarol overlaid with reflumolas, so here crisabarol is the yellow and reflumolas is the green. Look what happens. The way, because of the way crisabarol binds at the metal ion binding site, it is shifted up and away from the conserved glutamine. I told you that this glutamine is conserved in every PDE, right? Over 10 different types of PDEs, not just PDE4. Reflumolas has this hydrogen bond network, but crisabarol bends away. It's missing this critical conserved glutamine. And over here, if you uh, overlay crisabarol with AMP, the yellow with the pink, what you're seeing again is the same thing, that the, the AMP and crisabarol don't overlay at this end that's needed to be there to bind the conserved glutamine. So ultimately, and there's no, uh, there's not that that water as well in the middle. So here, what we have is one major anchor point, as, and not two or three, and it's only at the metal ion binding site. I guess it was worthwhile stuttering, stud, uh, studying crystals when you were a kid. <laughs> Chris, it, was, it, was. it paid off. <laughs> All right. So how do we simplify this for the clinicians? So reflumolas binding mimics cyclic AMP well. So you can see cyclic AMP bound to PDE4 on the left, and I've highlighted the glutamine, the hydrogen bond with water, and the metal ion binding site. Three key sites, reflumolas hits them all. I've broken down the reflumolas structure at the bottom to help people understand what each is doing. So if we start on the left in the pink, this is the dichloro, right, because you have two chlorine atoms, dichloropyridine group, and I point to the nitrogen that binds at the metal ion binding site. I, then the red in the middle is the benzamide core. You can see here that the NH binds the water. And then on the right, we have the difluoromethyl oxy group and the cyclopropyl methyl oxy group. And the oxygens from those two groups bind the conserved glutamine. So when you think about reflumolast, pretty simple. Three key binding sites mimic cyclic AMP but it has three key zones on the left, right, that then the pink that binds the metal, in the middle that binds the water, and on the right, the oxygens from those two uh, side chain groups that are binding the glutamine. That's the simple way to think about it.
Now, how do we put this in context of the whole class that we have available to us in, in, in dermatology? So PD-4 inhibitors are very much molecularly distinct. That's what I want to convey here. I show in the middle the reflumolast, the three sites that mimic cyclic AMP, the two sites for primolast, the one site for crisaberol. And we believe that this represents some of that difference or it explains the difference in binding affinity between these molecules. So I want to mention that molecular thinking, in my opinion, does impact patient care. PD-4 inhibition promotes anti-inflammatory effects by raising cyclic AMP. The available dermatologic PD-4 inhibitors are very different medicines. They have unique binding chemistry and it drives binding affinity differences. And you can see stronger to weaker here, which I've touched on already. Now, what I haven't touched on is that this better mimicking of cyclic AMP and this better binding to PDE4 actually also comes with enhanced selectivity of reflumolast. This cannot be overlooked. This is essential. So here in the first column, we're looking at reflumolast and then piclamolast, right? That's that derivative of reflumolast where you remove the fluorine atoms, right? And then you see in the last two columns, cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP, okay? I highlight in the red star, reflumolast, it hits PDE4B and D really, really, really strong, which are, are in the skin, more in the skin, right? But look at what it does with all the other PDE1, PDE2, PDE3, over 200 IC50. Look what it does. PDE5A, does anyone know what inhibits PD5, right? So Viagra. Lenophil yes. <laughs> targets PDE5. Then you have PDE6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Reflumolast isn't hitting those. It's really focused on PDE4. That's what distinguishes it from a kind of a broad spectrum a PDE inhibitor. It's really focused in on the PDE4 that's in the skin. And that selectivity is really important for reducing side effects. Now, back to our case. So here, this was that, that case that, in, that, that really just shook me uh, in clinic because I, was, I couldn't believe, honestly, that the topical reflumolast had such power to take away this woman's palmoplantar plantar pustular psoriasis that had made her suffer for so long, gave her so much pain when she was walking. I presented this at the World Congress of Dermatology in Singapore you know, about not eight, eight, nine months ago. Uh, and at the time, one of the questions that came up I had done this more as a quiz. I didn't give away that it was topical reflumolast from the beginning. I, and so someone asked, well, was it oral reflumolast instead of topical? What, was this a response to oral reflumolast? And so I want to put to rest a little bit of a, uh, a, a myth out there. But first, let's do the polling question, and we'll, we'll go from there. The oral form of reflumolast is likely to work even better in the skin than topical reflumolast. All right, let, let's... Let's see, it's easy, it's either true or false. You got 50% chance. We, we have this idea, right, that oral medicines are, are, are better than topical. All right, well, we got the results. Everybody voted. Oh, wow, split, even, I love it. Okay, all right, let's go back to the slides. See, I take back control. Actually, Chris, I'm glad you're showing this because there are many examples where we think the orals get higher concentrations and they don't. So this is really important. So it depends on the tissue, right? right. So if you're a dermatologist yes. you're, and you're thinking, I'm going to try oral reflumolast for all these dermatoses, you might want to try again. So oral reflumolast actually converts to an N-oxide. It undergoes N-oxidation. And so you get an N-oxide derivative of oral reflumolast in the skin. Doesn't mean oral reflumolast can't be used in COPD or other types of, of, of illnesses, but in the skin, it get, undergoes in oxidation. This actually makes it bind weaker to PDE4, okay? This is really, really, really uh, Im important because the science suggests the clinical effects of topical reflumolast cannot be improved upon by switching to oral reflumolast. So here, what I'm showing in the red arrow, this is our reflumolast structure and this nitrogen you can see here how it has now an oxygen, right? It's been, uh, it's undergone in oxidation here. 
And what, what is critical about that nitrogen, that's what's facing right at the metal ion binding site. So when you inoxidize this to an inoxide derivative, you're actually messing with the metal ion binding capacity of the molecule. And so this is why the oral reflumolast is not likely to exceed or beat topical reflumolast in the skin, okay? So now getting into seborrheic dermatitis. This has been such a major unmet need in dermatology. Just wanted to point out that in dermatology, having a PD-4 inhibitor for seborrheic dermatitis is groundbreaking. And I just wanted to touch on a couple things in my last couple of slides before Jim takes over here. And that is that we heard at the American Academy of Dermatology meeting a couple weeks ago that seborrheic dermatitis is a unique inflammatory skin disease and it has its own molecular signature. So work out of Mount Sinai with Emma Gutman and, and Benji Unger and, and their colleagues, they looked at 13, over 1300 differentially expressed genes uh, and they found that in seborrheic dermatitis, that there were around 674 with increased expression and 700 with de decreased expression compared to healthy controls. And what were the pathways they found? So I highlight that in the table below. Upregulated Th1, Th22, Th17, and I list some of those cytokines. And on the right, what was downregulated? Skin barrier proteins. And these skin barrier proteins, very importantly, are different than the ones that we see in atopic dermatitis that are downregulated. Here we have Cloudin-8, which is involved in tight junctions, uh, right? We have uh, FAA2H, which is the fatty acid to um, hydroxylase. And then we have this ELOVL3, which is uh, also involved in fatty acid uh, metabolism and synthesis. So we, here we have tight junctions and fatty acid and sphingolipid type metabolism that are being downregulated in the skin barrier. So what's really, really unique about this is again, we're seeing an overlap from multiple types of immune, uh, in, um, several types of immune disease, uh, immune inflammation, right? And so that's what I'm trying to show on the left here in this circle, is that PD and four, PD4 inhibitors have the power because of the role of PDE4 itself in Th1, Th2, Th17, Th22, and barrier disease or or uh, integrity. This shows that the broad power of PD4 inhibition is only becoming realized as we're able to harness the molecular power of PD4 inhibitors to a better degree. We now are able to inhibit more broadly these different pathways, which here in just seborrheic dermatitis, we see, right, that there's multiple pathways. We need a broad inhibitor like PD4, uh, like, a, like topical reflumolast, the PD4 inhibitor, to achieve suppression of all of these multiple pathways. And so I think this is a key point is that we're just now learning the full power of PDE4 and causing disease and how the inhibitors can remit multiple cytokine pathways. And, the, and what we're hearing as a buzzword are, is reflumolast responsive dermatoses. We're gonna hear this term more about reflumolast responsive dermatoses because it's able to broadly inhibit these different types of cytokines. All right, so I think this is my last polling question. Which is the key component of the reflumolast foam vehicle? Uh, hopefully you can see all the, the questions. I only see two on my screen, but neutral pH or ceramide stripping technology. And I think there's some others. Hopefully you can see all of those uh, when you vote. All right, so all of the above. Okay, Techn these are, they're not technically all key components of the reflumolast foam vehicle. So let's go to the, back to the slides and let's walk through this. And this is my last point, And then Jim will take us through the clinical uh, realm of, of reflumolast. Oh, I, I think I have to <laughs> advance the next one. Okay. The formulation of the foam, very important. The water content is higher in the foam than the cream. It's around 65%, not around 48 or 50%. It has some very important molecules that Jen's gonna talk about, right? This diethylene glycol bottom ethyl ether, it's a solvent to keep reflumolase dissolved. 
Crotophos technology, it's an emulsifier. And what's really important is that this is the first prescription product that's used the Crotophos technology. It's been in over-the-counter products, but this is the first prescription product. And it's very important because it's non-ceramide stripping. It's not stripping lipids that are very important for barrier integrity. I also wanted to point out uh, that it's formulated at a pH of 5.5. Why is that critical? The pH of the skin is around 5.5. And if you don't have topicals that mimic the, the correct pH of the skin, then what happens is that can cause keratin, filaggrin, and other barrier proteins to actually not function properly. It's also vegan, gluten-free, and fragrance-free, no propylene glycol, no polyethylene glycol, and no formaldehyde or formaldehyde-releasing agents. So th this is a pretty unique formulation, and at least for me as someone who studies in the laboratory barrier integrity, the lack of ceramide stripping and the proper pH formulation, I think are really, really big points. Okay, so before we'll go to Dr. Del Rosso, we have one more polling question. Does the vehicle matter in topical treatment? Guys, you know me, please don't disappoint me. <laughs> I, I think Chris uh, sort of gave the answer, but don't, it's true for all topicals. Don't break Leon's heart. Please. Wow, you are the best audience. I love you guys. Okay, we're going to move on to Dr. Derasso. He's going to give us the whole clinical perspective on raw formulas. Thank mm -hmm. you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. And I know Leon said I'm going to be focusing on some clinical aspects, but I know a little bit of science, but certainly not to the <laughs> molecular level that uh, Chris did such a beautiful job. I'm going to try to correlate some of that because it, it really all works together. So let's go to the polling question. Okay. Which of the following is not a non-steroidal topical treatment? Okay. Chris Aboro, Rufumilas, Tepinarov, none of them. So let's see if we can get to the answer, All right? So none of them, right? So Chris Aboro, Rufumilas, and Tepinarov are all non-steroidal topical agents. And Chris already went over Chris Aboro. Tepinarov is an aryl hydrocarbon receptor agonist, which is non-steroidal. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. Next slide. So when, when we look at where we are right now with topical reflumilast, we have two FDA approvals. We have it for plaque psoriasis in a 0.3% cream. The cream is what's been studied for plaque psoriasis once a day. It's approved to be used anywhere on the skin where the patient has plaque psoriasis, as long as they're six years of age and older. Any severity of disease, for any duration, so you don't have any limitation in terms of severity, where they can apply it, anywhere they have plaque psoriasis on their skin. The only limitation in the product monograph is the diagnosis and the age of the patient. And there's, Chris went over efficacy and, and, and some of the aspects of the clinical trials. We'll get a little bit more into that. Then more recently, we've had seborrheic dermatitis as an FDA approval, a 0.3% foam formulation, the major difference being that there's more water, as Chris mentioned, in the foam formulation than there is uh, in the cream formulation. The cream is about 50%, the foam's about, about two-thirds water. Uh, once a day, any location where the patient has seborrheic dermatitis. So it's not necessarily limited to the scalp like we often think of with seborrheic dermatitis and many of the therapies that we have are often used limited to the scalp because a lot of them are shampoos. But many of the patients will have other areas involved, as you know, which we'll get into. So any place they have seborrheic dermatitis and this agent was studied that way, any severity disease and any duration of disease. And we have efficacy and safety data, we'll get into that. There has been submission to the FDA of the cream formulation for atopic dermatitis, which is not yet FDA approved. There have been multiple studies completed, and all of these have had both short-term upfront studies and long-term data. 
And the studies that have been done for atopic dermatitis in patients that are at least six years of age or 0.15% and two to five years of age is a lower concentration, 0.05%. Favorable results thus far, uh, these have been published. We're not gonna be spending as much time on this because of, of, the, of the focusing on what's approved. And there's actually been a maintenance regimen with intermittent therapy that's been studied, but we'll hopefully get to that in a webinar in the future. Next slide, please. So Chris already mentioned about the formulation, and I think it's really important as this relates to what he was saying also about the pharmacokinetics and the difference between the oral formulation, which is approved for certain lung diseases, and the topical formulation. And I think the take home point here is when they looked at the pharmacokinetics, and I summarized it in the three studies up top, including a phase one maximum use study of the 0.3%, on a body surface area of 27.5%, which is more than what we're typically going to be using uh, topically for any of the diseases we treat. But there were higher levels in the skin with the topical than there are with the oral, and that has a, a lot to do with the difference between oral formulations is you don't take a drug and have it get absorbed and go through metabolism and go through all these different departments and its volume of distribution and go straight to the skin. There's a lot of reasons why levels may be lower within the skin, but Chris also mentioned the difference in the metabolism in the skin versus in other body locations. Also, what's interesting, and this does go back to the formulation, which I'll get to, there is a reservoir formation with drug retention of fumalast in the skin, in the superficial portions of the skin, and it's slowly released. So if you had this uh, application to the skin and suddenly got very high levels of refumilast systemically, it would get to the GI tract. And that's where we start getting concerned about PED, PDE4 inhibition in the GI tract. That's when you start to get some of the gastrointestinal problems like nausea, cramping, diarrhea, which we see with oral PD4 inhibition. This is one of the reasons why that's pretty much negligible in the studies. I can't say it's absolutely zero, but the reservoir in the skin actually leads to very low levels. Look at that flat curve on the peak to trough ratio. So that's very, very important. The pharmacokinetics of reflumalast it's really targeting predominantly the skin. And that was established by all this data, which is published. Next slide. So Jim, thank you so much for that information too. I think at least it's new to me about the reservoir information, I, uh, the reservoir there. So that's well, really good, thanks. We'll get into that a little bit more. In fact, we'll get into it right now. <laughs> okay. So a topical reflumalast, Chris already mentioned the, the, uh, the formulation. There are a couple of things to honed down here. So in order to get it into an aqueous formulation where you're not just putting in a lot of lipid because reflumalast needs to be lipid solubilized predominantly. And if you had a lot of lipid in this formulation, it would be very greasy, it would be very messy, it would be hard to use in the scalp. And we've seen that with other drugs that we try to get to be able to use on the skin. And no matter what they do with the vehicles, they tend to be very greasy and difficult to use on the scalp. This was really a brilliant formulation. Uh, and it's because of a couple of things. First of all, they could get it in a reasonable amount of water. Water also improves the tolerability. When you have to use a lot of propylene glycol, when you have to use ethanol, and some of the things that may help in terms of drug penetration, you have a lot of barrier difficulties that occur, a lot of stinging and burning and barrier impairment, and even allogenicity with propylene glycol. There's no propylene glycol in here, as was already mentioned. But look at the DEGEE, -E -E, the DGME, diethylene glycol monoethyl ether. It's been used a few other times in dermatology. It was used with topical dapsone in order to solubilize it. But one of the things that's really important, and this is from a publication uh, that I did include a review of this particular uh, agent, a couple of things that I show here, because it adds a lot 
to this formulation and it allows us to avoid many of the other excipients that create problems that I mentioned earlier, like propylene glycol, like ethanol, isopropyl alcohol. It's non-irritating and non-allergenic. It enhances solubility and intracutaneous penetration of various topical agents. If it was just letting the reflumolast just sit in the skin and not penetrate, then that wouldn't do us any good. But it allows for an increased reservoir capacity. And this is one of the things that's been identified with this particular uh, agent, this DGME. Very important part of this particular formulation to be able to solubilize the reflumolast and be able to compartmentalize it with a reservoir effect. It's also compatible with surface lipids. So it's not creating a problem with the lipids in the skin, which uh, Chris already went over several of the reasons why that's important. Also, hexylene glycol as opposed to propylene glycol as a solvent, at least the data that I can find, it's more barrier friendly than propylene glycol is, but it's a very effective solvent. So it was a smart choice here. Then the emulsifiers, as was mentioned, there are three of them that are in this combination trademark emulsifier that, that are utilized together. Crotophos, CES, which has actually been in other products, but the first time in a prescription product. What it allows, it allows the emulsification of the reflumolast while it's being made at very high temperatures to solubilize the reflumolast. But then when it gets down to regular room temperature in the final container, it does not solubilize lipids. So when you're applying it to the skin, it's not gonna damage the ceramides and the surface lipids. So it's barrier friendly. And that was a very, very wise aspect of this. Then there is some white petrolatum and uh, these are moisturization type ingredients, which I'll get to. Preservatives, methylparaben, and propylparaben, there's water. So you need a preservative but there's a very low risk of contact dermatitis and irritation with parabens. And the pH, there's just a little bit of so sodium hydroxide to get to the pH, the acid mantle of the skin, which is very important. If you get too alkaline or you get too acidic, you create damage within the stratum corneum and you also have enzymes and other agents that are normally functional within the skin being impaired by the wrong pH. So the pH is very important. Next slide. So we can move to the next slide. Okay. So this was, I think, a very interesting study. And this is with the topical reflumolast cream vehicle. It did not contain the reflumolast. But they just looked at in 40 patients where they had them on the legs, similar in terms of their clinical presentation of a mild eczematous dermatitis. So the sides were judged to be equal. And they applied a ceramide containing moisturizer that's uh, that's mar marketed and available versus the reflumolast vehicle, but they were blinded. So nobody knew exactly what they were getting. For a portion of this upfront, they a it actually was done in the office. So they made sure the right agent was being applied to the right side. And then they instructed the patients at home to what to use where. And at the end of the day, what they really showed, looking at transepidermal water loss and several clinical parameters, and you can see here, there are many of them listed there, they all fall on top of each other, regardless of whether one side was utilizing the ceramide containing, moistur uh, ceramide containing moisturizer or utilizing the reflumolast vehicle. So in really essentially in all the parameters, they, they, work, they work the same right, in that regard. So the secret sauce, it's a very important part of this. The reflumolast is extremely important, and that was highlighted by Chris beautifully, but the vehicle is also very important for all these diseases. We're gonna talk about how we know it's very important in seborrheic dermatitis, which a lot of people have not necessarily appreciated. Next slide. So if we can move it along. So let's move on to psoriasis. Next slide. I just want to summarize a few things about psoriasis. A lot of the data you've seen, we're not going to go through all the phase two and three C beta. Next slide, please. Okay. So we have a polling question. 
Let's bring up the question. Which of one of the following has phase three clinical study results for intertriginous psoriasis? So pick the one you think is correct based on the phase three studies specifically for intertriginous psoriasis separately as opposed to, it, it, they did the entire psoriasis, but they also drilled down separately on intertriginous psoriasis. Which drug did they do that with? Okay, if we can bring up the answers. Okay, Riflumilast, that was the only one where they did a separate investigator in a global assessment for the intertriginous areas and evaluated the efficacy and safety. Next slide. Yep. So move on. So this is just giving you an idea of you can have a range of outcomes, right? You're seeing a patient with a much thicker plaque on the knee, something that may take a little bit longer to budge at week four, it stayed as severe. But if you keep utilizing the agent, you'll see that it'll pick up and the patients will get improvement. You see on the elbow, it responded faster. So I let patients know this drug is very, very gonna, likely gonna work for you. But in some cases, in some plaques on the, on the same patient, it may work a little faster, some a little slower, but with rare exception, it will get there. And you don't have to worry about the side effects that you might with some other agents. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now this is showing something with regard to the intertriginous areas. So if you're looking at the this is the investigative global uh, success and uh, getting to clear on the left, and you're seeing it in the second study on the right, because there were two phase three studies. You're seeing the darker blue is the clear, and the lighter shows the patients that also got to almost clear. In both studies, kicks in very quickly in the intertriginous areas, and you can see here excellent results getting patients to clear, but look at the vehicle. The vehicle is very important in the intrusionist areas and it kicks in and it hangs at a certain level that contributes, but the reflumolase is obviously the heavy lifter. But the vehicle does not get in the way and in some cases even contributes to a complete clearance in the patients that just use the vehicle alone. Next slide. So there's a lot of ways to look at what the vehicle is actually doing with this drug. Next slide. Okay. Okay. And we're kind of we're kind of hung up here. Right? So I think this is very important. Two important questions, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think this is very important on how we look at, at, at therapies. When we have bar graphs, we can't necessarily tell what's going on with all of the patients. So can we graphically show how individual patients respond? And with the PASI score, which actually does not allow us to effectively look at lower body surface areas, which is where we're typically using topical drugs, a body surface area of less than 10%, that is why there's been the development of the PASI HD, high definition versus the PASI alone. And Waterfall plots are also the way to go. So we have 500 beautiful waterfalls in the United States. I'm gonna show you number 501. Next slide, Leon, Leon's chuckling. Next slide. So to answer the question, can we show the patients individually? And you're moving too fast. You, you, blew my, you blew my joke, okay. <laughs> we'll go right to this slide. Stephen A. Smith and the Easter Bunny alike how can that be? How could you do this? Well, they did it. Next slide. Okay. Yep. Okay. Next slide. So the PASI HD, when the PASI is done, if you're looking at any of the areas and let's say it's 9% body surface area in a location, that gets a rating of one for the PASI score. But let's say four weeks later in that area, it's only 3% in that patient. The old PASI is what I like to call it, still gives a score of one. So you cannot differentiate that difference with a PASI score on low body surface areas. The HD uses the thumb 
to give you levels of 0.1% involvement. So you can actually look at those differences because the thumb we've learned from with vitiligo is 0.1%. The hand is 1%. So it allows us to do this. So let's move to the next slide. So a lot of people just get, get caught up in the weeds of, next slide please, in the weeds of the waterfall plot, okay? Let's hope we can see that here's a beautiful waterfall. So what you're looking at here is, and I put stars in the two different locations, you can pick any parameter you want. And what you're looking at, if you look at on the right, this will show you the difference in how many patients got to a PASI HD, 75% reduction or 50% reduction in the PASI score. And we'll pick the 50 as something that, that is, is meaningful in clinical practice. You can see here the PASI HD gave you a better discrimination and showed you the actual true better results the PASI didn't capture. And then when you get over, this is at week four. We have it at week two and week six. I didn't want to go through all those slides. Let's go to week eight so I could summarize this. Next slide. So you see here, we're moving to the left. We're capturing, as we're treating longer, we're capturing more and more people that are responding. Right, so the PADGHD, HD, you're up to 80% of them. PASI 50, uh, you know, you have 60%, you know, PASI 75, and it's much lower with the old PASI. So you would not have captured that. You would have devalued what the drug is doing in a lower body surface area. And then if you even look at, to the left, you can see that you're not getting a drop off that the other patients are not responding. You have many of the patients still getting close to those endpoints. So I think what this shows is if you keep utilizing this particular agent, you will see more and more people capture efficacy. But the PASI HD is, a, is really a better way to look at lower body surface area involvement with topical agents. Next slide. You and know, Jim, is... I really like this waterfall uh, graph. It is so meaningful because, you know, we all get these numbers, a statistical analysis, but isn't it important to see each patient where they are? And when you look at that graph, almost everybody is getting better, maybe except a handful of patients, right? So when right. you write a prescription, that's what you want. And it is so meaningful that you can see each single patient here. And it, and it allows us to understand what's likely to happen with patients. Some yeah. people are gonna uh, kick in faster, some slower. I don't care what drug it is, the best of the biologics, the best of the jacks, that's what's gonna happen with all the patients. I think every drug should have waterfall plots on parameters. Chris, what do you think? We've talked about waterfalls a lot. We both like waterfalls. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the waterfall plots. I like for exactly what Leon said. I like knowing where each patient is throughout the time course of a trial. It's so invaluable to understand the trajectory of patient response. Right, exactly. And that's what it does. Next slide. Oh, this is the polling question. Okay. Which one of the following is approved for seborrheic dermatitis? Let's hope they get this right, Chris. Right. Well, let's see what they're saying here. Okay. I think they will. Yeah, I think they will too. We have 70%. Chris, I'm I'm going to have to call my uncles and cousins in New York and find out who that other 32% are. <laughs> pay them pay them a visit. They weren't paying attention and you know, or or they're pulling our chain. It's, it's reflumolast, and we're going to get into that a little bit more. But but topical reflumolast, the foam, once a day, is FDA approved uh, for uh, uh, for uh, a, for seborrheic dermatitis anywhere the patient has it. Next slide. Okay. Next slide, please. So seborrheic dermatitis, no, no, go back. A little bit of a trigger finger there. Let's go back. So I think seborrheic dermatitis, we all know what it is. But if we think about seborrheic dermatitis and we said, who are the gurus that we go to that have told us about the pathophysiology of disease and brought us up to date on that pathophysiology 
and are the go-to people like Mark Lebwall and Bruce Strober in, in uh, psoriasis or Ali Gallant, Emmy, Emma Gutman, Jonathan Viz, uh, Silverberg. It, there are several different people, atopic dermatitis and others. We don't have it with seborrheic dermatitis because there really has been very little work done on it. But we all know how to identify it. We all know it has sites of predilection, usually a pink erythema, not that deep, you know, burgundy colored erythema that you can sometimes see, a very fine scaling, and several different areas involved. Even the groin and genital area and axilla can be involved in some patients. And it can affect anyone, any race, color, or creed. It might look different in patients with, uh, with darker skin. And remember that many of these patients might have overgrowth of malassezia. Malassezia also can cause tinea versicolor and may be contributing to some of the hypopigmentation that you see in some cases, but you might need to differentiate it in some patients on the face. Next slide. Yeah. So what do we know about seborrheic dermatitis? Looking at some of the more recent information, the focus has been on malassezia and the drugs that were developed, you know, FDA approved treatments like, like ketoconazole foam, and we'll go over that, right? Uh, cyclopyrox shampoo, uh, and obviously several different over-the-counter treatments were focused on malassezia. Bringing down the malassezia could improve the seborrheic dermatitis, but it didn't get rid of it completely, and it didn't explain the whole story. When those agents were being developed, remember, they didn't know about the skin barrier dysfunction. In fact, it didn't come up a lot even with any diseases other than to use moisturizers on atopic dermatitis. We now know so much more, right? And I'll show you where skin barrier dysfunction, there is definite data to show that's a very important part of the disease. It contributes to the pathophysiology of the disease, along with malassezia, either the counts or some way that the host is interacting with malassezia. And some of the cytokine patterns that that uh, Emma, Do uh, Dr. Unger and Emma Gutman and others have pointed out do show some of that. Host immunity, individual host immunity is important. And I listed on the right a few things that have been talked about in the literature that we still need to get some information. But we do know seborrheic dermatitis is seen more commonly in patients that have some neurologic diseases like Parkinson's disease. I remember my grandfather distinctly as a kid with bad Parkinson's disease and bad seborrheic dermatitis. Next slide. So this is a very important paper. And it's from 2023. It's the Russell paper. And this paper actually looked at a variety of different aspects, but it did do some actual testing to look at epidermal barrier function. So they looked at the microbiome also. They looked, they actually did not see an increase in, in malassezia, though some studies have, uh, but they did show that there are different differences in the barrier. So by utilizing standard techniques, they saw erythema, they saw scaling, they saw increased transepidermal water loss, right? In seborrheic dermatitis skin, uh, these were patients that had facial seborrheic dermatitis, 37 patients with mild to moderate seborrheic dermatitis. And they compared to some control aspects uh, of what you would expect, but they showed there were definite changes in ceramide composition. So for ceramides and the lipid layer to function and control transepidermal water loss and keep the barrier functioning the way it needs to be with the right uh, content, there needs to be a relative differences in terms of the types of ceramides, also the length of the ceramides. So there are definite aberrations in the distribution of the ceramides and how, whether they had the right chain length. So there was definitely ceramide and barrier dysfunction in seborrheic dermatitis. And they argue that seborrheic dermatitis is associated with skin barrier dysfunction and changes in ceramide composition that is part of the disease pathophysiology. This is relatively new to us. We never talked about barrier 
in seborrheic dermatitis. Not only the scalp, this was on the face where we see a lot of this disease. Next slide. So if you're thinking about treatment, you want a therapy that addresses the barrier and also the inflammation like Chris talked about with the reflumolast. Now, this is a very interesting paper that was that was on seborrheic dermatitis looking beyond malassezia. And it covered a lot of aspects of the data we have on malassezia and it, it plays a role, but there are several other aspects to it. And what you're looking at here in normal skin and don't get confused by some of those things like the MPZL3, that's a knockout mouse that they used to study. And that ZNF750 is a transcription factor that has to do with, with, with genes that lead to barrier of proteins that Chris went over. But if you look on the right, barrier dysfunction clearly pays a role along with an immune activation and also the activity of malassezia all working together in patients that have sebaceous gland activity because that's when the sebum, that's what malassezia thrives on is sebum. So there is a pathophysiology of seborrheic dermatitis that we're learning more about that topical reflumolast addresses a lot of this. Next slide. So this was the, the same paper, and it's interesting that we're talking about the cytokines that are upregulated or in leading to inflammation. We didn't necessarily know about all the different pathways, but you can see here that a pro-inflammatory signaling milieu has been identified in seborrheic dermatitis. Look at all those cytokines that are there. Many of them are things that Chris talked about, but when they actually looked at not only the malassezia count, but the malassezia count being reduced, that's not enough alone. And they make the point that barrier restoration as a preventative measure to seborrheic dermatitis should be more rigorously explored and certainly part of the management of the disease. So that goes back to the importance of that vehicle with topical reflumolast with how it was formulated. That's why we spend so much time on that. It's not only the active ingredient, which obviously, as Chris pointed out, is very important in reducing the inflammation in many of these cytokine areas that are involved in seborrheic dermatitis. Next slide. So this is something that Chris already talked about, so I'm not gonna uh, go into this as much as I anticipated, but it does show us that seborrheic dermatitis, based on the data that they did at Mount Sinai that was just recently shown, uh, looking at, let's see, it's 27 patients that have mild to severe seborrheic dermatitis on the face versus normal facial controls. They did look at historic expressions uh, in psoriasis and atopic dermatitis as a comparison. There are some occasional overlaps of cytokines, which we talked about, but seborrheic dermatitis is distinct. It has Th17, uh, Th22 involvement, which is very important. It has some dysregulation in some of the lipids, and Chris addressed some of that. It has a unique pathophysiology that is due to barrier impairment and inflammation. And this data supports this. It is distinct from psoriasis and is distinct from, from uh, atopic dermatitis in its overall uh, pathways of involvement. But there is some overlap of cytokines. There are diseases don't own cytokines. They could show up in a lot of different, cytokines can show up in a lot of different places. Next slide. So that's the summary of, of what I said. Chris, do you have anything else you want to highlight on this more than what we have already said? Because I think this is an important finding. Oh, it's a very important finding. I, I think that the main take home point is, is what you said, that seborrheic dermatitis is a unique disease, but it's also a unique disease that involves multiple inflammatory and immune pathways. So you need a therapy that's not kind of ultra-targeted, but something that actually is broad and able to hit these different immune pathways. And part of what we're trying to, to, to teach and educate on is that PD-4 inhibition uh, is an incredibly smart, effective, and safe way 
to actually tackle multiple uh, inflammatory and immune pathways, particularly in relation to seborrheic dermatitis. And it's ubiquitous in the skin. It's in every cell, right? It's it's preserved in every cell as part of normal homeostatic mechanism, but it's dysregulated in different diseases like well, aseborrheic dermatitis. Well, I think that, that what you're emphasizing is why I made that one slide that said that we're just starting to unlock some of the full potential of PDE4 inhibition. Right. Uh, because I, I think PDE, PDE4 and PDEs in general, I think are way more important to, to disease and inflammation than we realize. And, and there's a lot of room for innovation improvement in, in this particular area as, as Reflumalast is teaching us. Okay, so let's get to some uh, clinical areas that uh, you may not be as familiar with because they're not necessarily things that are shown in the, in the phase three clinical trials. Next slide. So topical treatment for seborrheic dermatitis, trying to look for FDA approved treatment for seborrheic dermatitis is not easy. Next slide. Next slide, please. So topical treatment for seborrheic dermatitis, looking at seborrheic dermatitis in general, not just prescription therapies, there are a plethora of choices. So just think about patients trying to manage this and going, now they go on websites and things and they go to blogs and right, but even at a pharmacy going down the aisle of all the different over the counters, most of them are going to be uh, shampoos for the scalp. And a lot of times the focus has been on the scalp because people see the dandruff on their clothes. So the focus is on the scalp, but obviously it can be involved in other areas. And there are prescription options. Now, uh, corticosteroids, some of the older corticosteroids back in the day, we're talking years ago when i in leon and mine's earlier years chris was uh was, may not have been starting quite yet <laughs> but a lot of these agents were approved for steroid responsive dermatoses so anything you thought was a steroid responsive dermatosis you can put the drug on but not necessarily tested for seborrheic dermatitis but we know topical corticosteroids can reduce the inflammation quickly but how long are you going to use them and we do have some evidence with another agent that after even a low potency topical corticosteroid is stopped um, as compared to a non-steroidal agent that the the recurrence is faster after this the, and after the discontinuation of the corticosteroid and there might be a lot of reasons for that and i think that's something you're where we've observed. So I'm not gonna tell you corticosteroids don't work because they do, but how long are you gonna use them? And where are the people using them? They get it, if they've had it for one area, are they gonna start using it in other areas? And don't forget corticosteroid side effects, we don't necessarily see all of them. We don't see increased intraocular pressure when people may be applying them too much around the eyes. Now we've used them for years, uh, they're excellent drugs, but when we have other agents that we can use that are effective, that we don't have to be concerned when people are going back to them and using them in new locations for as long as they need to and can start and stop when they need to. I think that's all very important. So we're not here to corticosteroid bash, but we're here to be realistic of how different drugs are used. The antifungal agents, ketoconazole, which is an ethanol-based foam. This was back in the day when you wanted to dissolve the scale with ethanol and you wanted to get penetration, they weren't thinking about the barrier. This is not a very barrier friendly agent. It was FDA approved twice a day for four weeks. On the scalp is where most people used it. It was approved anywhere. You could use it on the skin, but it was harder to use a hydroethanolic foam, one that was ethanol based on the skin right? And it was formulated very differently. It would run. It's not a no-break foam like like uh, like Zareve foam or, you know, Reflumalast foam that stays in its place. As soon as you put it on the skin, it would start running as a solution. So it was very difficult to con control. Cyclopyrox is approved as a shampoo twice a week for four weeks. And the ketoconazole foam four weeks. So there was a limitation on the duration of use. And there are selenium sulfide prescriptions, shampoos and lotions, but they're not for all the locations. 
So the reflumolast foam could be used on any of the locations, scalp. That's one of the scalp and anywhere else on the skin. Zinc pyrithione, and there is a device agent that doesn't have one active uh, ingredient that was approved off the scalp on the skin, but wasn't really amenable for the scalp. Next slide. So next polling question, okay. Which of the following has a foam formulation? We'll see how well I explain that one, Chris. <laughs> Let's see what people say. Yeah, and, and I can say that the early response I've had from patients uh, using the, the foam has been very receptive. They like uh, how it works on the scalp and elsewhere on the body. I think that with some of the the, the topical steroids, I think that the greasiness in the hair, that they tend to not like that as much, at least when their scalp seborrheic dermatitis, it, it can be an issue for some patients. Yeah, and, and you they, you have to have one formulation for the scalp and then a different one for the skin, and and it goes on and on and on, even with some of the other drugs. So topical reflumolast, 56%. No, there is no foam of chrysoboral. There is no foam of topinarov. Reflumolast is the only one that has a foam formulation, and that is FDA approved for seborrheic dermatitis. Next slide. So Chris, I guess we didn't explain that uh, good enough, but this is from the package insert. So I'm showing you this for a reason. It, the foam is approved for seborrheic dermatitis in adults and pediatric patients as long as they're nine years of age and older. No limitation on severity, no limitation on duration, no limitation on location, okay? It was actually studied. Oh, at least seven out of 10 patients had more than one site involved. The studies in order to get to the endpoint all the areas that were treated had to get to clear or almost clear with at least a two grade improvement, right? And so that, that's an important distinction. Then if you're just looking at one site and trying to reach that endpoint, very important to recognize that it is in this canister that is propelled. There are propellants in there. So when you look at, we'll get to the contraindications, but you look at the one warning and precaution that's listed, the flammability, it's the propellant when it's being pressed to be propelled out of the canister. The propellants are flammable. It's not as if an hour later, two hours later, somebody is by a flame, by a, by a fi fireplace, or lights a cigarette, that their face is going to combust, right? It's not it's not that type of situation. It's when it's actually being propelled. So that's where you do have to be careful about flames and, and a lit cigarette sort of thing. The contraindication is related to the oral drug. So there is a contraindication patients with moderate to severe liver impairment based on the, the, the classifications that they use, the internists and hepatologists and GI doctors use. That's because the reflumolast, it's given orally. Obviously, it's in the serum. The half-life increases with the topical agent, the way we're typically using it with the low levels and, and the limited body surface area. This is not likely to be something that's going to create a problem for you, but it is in the package insert as a contraindication. What I'm showing you on the left is I think it's very important to demonstrate with that demonstration can to patients exactly how to use this because it's not metered. When they press down that lever to propel it, it's going to keep coming out as long as they keep pressing it. So just a very a quick press, it'll stay right where it is, like on the two fingers. The package insert says do it in the hand. I happen to like the cap, and I can tell you this picture is way too much. Typically, about a third of a cap is going to give you, at most a half of a cap, is going to give you all the product you need for all the areas that are involved because it spreads very easily and they can just take it and put it on the areas and part the scalp. But that's a very important part to understand about this. Next slide. If the patients aren't told, then you'll get phone calls, how do I use this? But they'll, they'll eventually learn it. Next slide. But it's a good idea to make sure they know. So this is just showing you, it's very important here to see that the mean itch and this is one particular study that did go down to the age of nine, up to 20% body surface area. But the mean body surface area on all the areas involved, 
that could have been involved in a patient. And over 70% had multiple areas involved. The mean body surface area for Sebderm was 3%. If they have 20% body surface area, I'd be wondering if they had Sebderm, but I guess it's possible. Uh, the, the mean worst itch was a five on a scale of zero to 10. Two thirds of the patients had four or greater. So to get that meaningful poor point reduction in itch, you can evaluate that in two thirds of the patients. That's 206 patients that were actively treated, 98 in the vehicle. So that's what you're seeing on the left. At week two, three out of 10 patients got had at least a four point reduction in itch. That's what the FDA uses as the criteria of success for itching. By week four, half the patients, and by week eight, six out of 10 patients. And that's a four point reduction in itch. Possible that a three point reduction or a two point reduction may have been very meaningful, but that's the criteria used by the FDA. Now look on the right, what you're seeing up top is nine out of 10 patients in the study had scalp involvement, six out of 10 had face, five out of 10 had ears, uh, ear involvement. And you can see here eyelids, about one out of 10, the trunk about one out of 10, the neck at about one out of 10, and many patients had multiple areas involved, and all of them were treated and assessed to reach the successful endpoints in the study. And you can see here on the bottom at week two, four out of 10 got uh, clear, almost clear with at least a four grade improve, a two grade improvement by week eight, seven out of 10, I'm sorry, let me start again. Four out of 10 by week two, seven out of 10 by week four, eight out of 10 by week eight, got clearer, almost clear with at least a two grade improvement on all the areas that were treated. That's a very important distinction. Next slide, that's an eight, eight week study. Next slide. Yeah. I'm sorry about the technical difficulty. Now, what about adverse events? We didn't talk about this a lot, but the fact of the matter is, if you look at the psoriasis data, and if you look at the data here with seborrheic dermatitis, there's mostly concern about you're gonna get the side effects that you might get with an oral PD-4 inhibitor, because there really wasn't much in terms of systemic safety signals. In the psoriasis pivotal trials, 97% of the patients did not report any diarrhea. And the majority of patients that had diarrhea was neg was pretty negligible. It didn't interfere with the continued use of the drug. Um, and that was very, very low concern. And obviously, if patients are using 10% body surface area or less, which they're typically going to be doing, though they can go up to 20%, um, that's not very likely going to happen. But I'm not gonna tell you it's zero, but diarrhea can occur unrelated to the drug. In the seborrheic dermatitis trials, where you looked at at least 1%, there were no patients that reported diarrhea in the study. So I think it goes back to that reservoir effect and that slow release, that utilizing this drug the way we typically will use it it's not something you're going to necessarily going to run into. Now, the tolerability, and this was reported by Chris, Neil Bacha, myself, um, and is, it was, it's been reported at several meetings now. Investigator and patient rated local tolerability in the studies. There were a few different studies that were involved. There was the dermis and the erector study. Those were uh, in plaque psoriasis, the erector was in body and scalp psoriasis with the foam. The, the, uh, the uh, pool derma study was with the cream. Then you have the stratum study with seborrheic dermatitis with the foam. And then you have the integument study which is atopic dermatitis data. That's not FDA approved. But all the indications, here you're looking at patients that had face and genital involvement, so a significant number of them did. If you look at the investigator and also the patient, I'm only showing the investigator here, but also the patients, in well into the high 90 percentile, you didn't see any local tolerability reactions or very minimal in, in terms of some stinging, burning, and tingling. So the tolerability in all the indications was essentially the same. 
even in atopic dermatitis where we think of a more sensitive barrier. And seborrheic dermatitis can have itching and has some barrier dysfunction. I think the bottom line is we think about stinging and burning because we've had a topical PD4 inhibitor for atopic dermatitis that was approved that we've ran into stinging and burning in the real world. And we don't want that hung on the idea of PD4 inhibition, right? And this shows that the potency can be different amongst different PD4 inhibitors that Chris pointed out, but PD4 inhibition does not have to do with the tolerability. It, I mean, I mean, with yeah, PD4 inhibition does not have to do with the tolerability of the product. So we don't want to make that jump just thinking that it's going to happen with all PD4 inhibitors. Next slide. I'm trying to get wrap up here if we can move the slides along. Impact of itching. These are all the different su uh, studies. You can see here plaque psoriasis, body and scalp psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis. You're seeing all the different studies that have been done here. Right, pretty large number of patients in different age groups. Next slide, over 1,900 patients that were actively treated with Rifumilast. Next slide. And you see here, regardless of which you look at, here you're looking at the worst itch uh, week eight with the cream or the foam in the different studies where it was used in, in seborrheic dermatitis and also uh, scalp and body psoriasis with the foam. And with the cream in, in, in plaque psoriasis, you can see here that you had very favorable success in terms of itch reduction, scalp itch reduction, you see in the middle. And then you see uh, with the uh, atopic dermatitis study on the right, the difference in the 0.15% cream versus the vehicle, This is that was at week four. So itch reduction was very, very favorable. If you look on the bottom, I'm showing this for a reason, the worst itch with seborrheic dermatitis with the foam, you see that the active and the vehicle, the vehicle very importantly, because of its of its being friendly to the barrier, does contribute. It's very it, it's helpful to have a good barrier agent in as your vehicle to help with itching. Next slide. We've seen that in other studies also. But the reflumolast kicks it up even further. Next slide. So this is the, this is one I just want to point out what they did. They went back and and took patients that were evaluated with seborrheic dermatitis with the 0.3% cream and they um, I'm sorry the foam and they went back and looked at patients that could not use topical steroids. They maybe they didn't respond. Maybe they had used it too much and they wanted to cut back. Uh, whatever the reason was, they didn't want to do it. These were patients that had been on topical corticosteroids, but now they weren't going to get them again. Maybe they had an adverse event. It could have been done for a variety of reasons. And they went and looked at this subset of patients over eight weeks. Next slide. They looked at several different parameters, and I'll show you the summary of that. Okay, next slide, please. I don't know what the hang up is. Okay, so what you're seeing here in that subset analysis in the phase three stratum study, this was the Reflumla 0.3% foam. When they looked at inadequate response intolerance or contraindication, topical corticosteroids. Um, to, I mean, to topical corticosteroids, the Reflumolast foam had a 3.5 times greater uh, chance of getting to IgA success in those patients than the vehicle did. And these were patients that could not use topical corticosteroids. And then the quality of life indices did extremely well in the Reflumolast foam group versus the vehicle. So these are different ways to look at such questions that you might have in clinical practice. Next slide. So polling question number 10, okay. which of the following is being studied for atopic dermatitis? Okay, okay. Let's see what answer you have here. Actually, both have been studied and have been submitted to the FDA. So we should be hearing this year, hopefully. 
with non-steroidal therapies. Nerfalimilast, obviously, very promising based on the data we have. So it's B and C. So reflumilast, obviously, people have heard about. To pin her off the aryl hydrocarbon receptor agonist is also been studied and submitted for atopic hermatitis. So we have two non-steroidal agents uh, that we expect to have later this year. Next slide. I believe we're turning over to you now, Leon. Yes. Okay. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this was really, really very illuminating. And we had basically a great lecture of bench to the clinic for Roflomilas. So we have some time and we're going to discuss a little bit more the questions that we have. Uh, we have a bunch of questions. Let me just go and find, start the first one. Are PD4s indicated for vitiligo? No. Okay. This is a good one. Does roflomilas also block interferon gamma? Yes, Chris, you can elaborate. That's one of the Please. cytokines, but I'll let Chris elaborate. Yeah, so it's its ability to uh, block Th1 pathways. It, it will reduce interferon gamma, TNF alpha. Uh, another great question. Why was the concentration lowered for atopic dermatitis? Uh, I, I think the, the feeling there was, and I, you'd really have to go to the, the company, and I think you can get some, some good answers for the company. I think the feeling there was atopic dermatitis obviously has a barrier impairment, and in the beginning, you, you could potentially get more, more absorption until it starts to correct itself. And we've seen that with some other drugs, but also you have the body surface area ratio difference and the fact that it's likely going to be effective at lower concentrations. And that's what the data seems to be showing. So I think it, I think it does make a lot of sense, especially when you get down to age two to five, um, where they're also, they also have looked at some intermittent regimens. I, I think that was the reasoning there. Maybe Chris knows more on that. But that's my own. I was just going to say. I'm just going to say that when you have higher binding affinity, you may not need as much drug for an effect. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. That also is how you limit side effects. But also, I think that the that the main discussion that I've heard around this was the the barrier, just the the, the what you said about the barrier, but also that uh, in younger children with atopic dermatitis, if you were trying to push this down into the pediatric population, there was concern about the the, the barrier uh, there as well. Uh, but I think that I think that part of the answer is they probably could have pushed the dose higher. Another great question from a really good friend of mine from Long Island is: Septuermin a continuum with psoriasis? Is what? Is septuerm on a continuum with psoriasis? I think a lot of people have thought that you know, with the whole concept of seborrheosis, but I do think that the information we're getting from the, these pathophysiology studies that are looking at the different cytokines. And the Unger group with Emma Gutman actually looked at pathways and looking at how these are together in different pathways, which some of the uh, earlier work just found cytokines individually. So I, I think it's different. I think it's a different yeah. entity. Well, I think, Leon, the best way to think about it, it's not that they're on continuum. Each one of these is there, you know, when I say each one of these, I mean, Seborrheic dermatitis, psoriasis, and atopic dermatitis—they're—they're they're your own unique disease, but it's like a Venn diagram. There's the ability to overlap and share certain expression profiles. So subsets of patients may have expression of cytokine profiles and other markers uh, that kind of overlap between the three diseases. So it's not a continuum; it's an overlap for a subset of patients that share common. Uh, marker, uh, biomarker abnormalities. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but when we look at some other diseases, some, patient may, some patients may have more of a specific overlap, which is why it's looking a certain way. Not yeah. everybody's the same, right? And so some patient may have less, which is well, why diseases the, look different. One of the biggest things from the, the latest uh, tape stripping biomarker uh, study is just simply that, again, the the genes that are downregulated in the barrier dysfunction seem to be different than atopic dermatitis. Right. So this creates a whole other set of biochemical and 
and, and other uh, studies that can be done to understand, well, what's really different about the barrier in seborrheic dermatitis versus atopic dermatitis? Because I think that the tight junctions and the, the lipid metabolism uh, arena in seborrheic dermatitis is obviously largely unexplored. Next Try one to, is a rough no, way. Go I'm ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm trying to get that light out of my face, but I'm not oh. going to. <laughs> Can you safely use Roflomilas in pregnancy and in breastfeeding? I, I would say that we don't necessarily know because that's not studied. So I think the recommendation is to be cautious in that situation, but it's, it's not listed as contraindications. Yeah, I agree. But as you know, none of the I would I, I would not I would not right now myself. Yeah, I, I don't either. I mean, I, I I'm very I shouldn't say safety prone, but medical legal prone. You know, yeah. every third person in New York City is an unemployed lawyer, and so. I always, anytime when I give a prescription to a pregnant patient, I actually ask the OBGYN if it's okay to do it. So uh, what about the, in Connecticut, Chris, at Yale? Are you protected by Yale? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. No. <laughs> Nobody is protected, Jim. Yeah, good job. Um, this is a good one. Um, could you please suggest over-the-counter products that may help maintain scalp skin barrier function in seborrheic dermatitis. I don't know any, maybe you guys do? Well, th there have been a couple of companies that, uh, one in particular, Unilever, that has put out a system, shampoo, and et cetera, uh -huh. that, that's barrier friendly because they're in the business of sensitive skin and barrier that are out there that are marketed for that, but I have not seen actual data. They may have it, but there are a few that are marketed that way by companies that do pay attention to that as far as the adjunct of what kind of shampoo you want to use, what kind of conditioner you want to use, because it can get difficult. But patients, many patients are very specific about their shampoos and their conditioners, and they don't want to change that. So, but sometimes they're the problem. Well, when I was a resident, one of the tricks that I learned from Gene Bologna is that we would use Neutrogena body oil, and then we would be able to mix in things like salicylic acid or whatever, depending on the amount of scaling on the scalp. But we would use as our core Neutrogena body oil, and then we could mix things in and then use that on the scalp. So I do think that there are some agents out there over the counter that, that tend to moisturize and help the, the scalp. Right. Yeah, that, there was the sesame seed oil. Charlie Camisa taught me to use it, do it with with light mineral oil with sal acid. You know, yeah. same kind I've of heard thing. People, I've heard, I've had patients use olive oil too, and have good success. And does ro roflomilas foam work as well for scalp psoriasis as it does for seborrheic dermatitis? Well, there's Great been question. no there's been no comparison, but there was a scalp and body study that was done with the foam that it did perform very well. I showed some of that data, uh, but I don't think we have a direct comparison. So, I, I mean, we did the study. I was part of that study for scalp psoriasis as well as body psoriasis with the foam. And that should come out hopefully soon, right? Um, yeah. But there is no, you know, you cannot study two different diseases in the same study, right. in the same study. Right. Um, do you see any patients become resistant to roflomilas and start to have lack of efficacy? No, uh, and, I, and have not uh, that I've not seen it. Uh, you know, I don't know, Chris. Maybe you remember. We we can easily find out from some of the sources. I don't think we have a lot of start, uh, you know, start and stop data other than in the long term study that they did with the foam, patients were able to stop and restart depending on the severity of the disease. And the pattern overall is you captured more improvement in the overall population. So I would have to say that it does continue to work when you need to go back to it based on that data. I would have to say this. I think that the root of the question is getting, does reflumolast or PD-4 inhibitors exhibit tachyphylaxis like the steroids? And to my, I haven't heard that with crisaberol or reflumolast. Um, maybe that, that's a question that we need to pay attention to all the clinicians and look for, uh, but I, I haven't heard or seen that. 
Yeah, well, Steve, Steve Feldman would tell us it's compliance, not tachyphylaxis, right, Leon? Yes. Well, on that note, we are almost on the top of the hour. And the last comment was that this was a great talk. This was a great program. So I think all of you guys, all the listeners, I also thank our supporter, Arcutis, who was able to make this program um, available to us tonight. So I thank you very much, guys. I finish this program here tonight. And then please tune in for our next IDF educational series webinar that are sponsored by uh, BMS for Exploring TIC2. And we're going to have Dr. Jason Hawks from Sacramento, California. I thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Jason's excellent, so I'll be tuning in for that. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Great job.